Well, it seems to fit the season, doesn't it? If you have a Bible with you this morning, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the uh, Gospel of Luke, the first chapter this morning as we continue this series we've called Scandalous. Thanks for singing happy birthday to me. Say goodbye to Pastor Charles on your way out the door this morning. And uh, if, uh, if you're wondering how old I am, just, just know this. I look really good for 64 and really bad for 44, so I'm somewhere in the middle. So... Uh, Luke chapter 1, I'm going to start reading this morning at verse uh, 26, and while you're turning there, I do want to encourage you on a couple of things. First of all, you heard Grace and Pastor Charles talk about Go Tell It, that's two weeks from today, it's going to be a great Christmas Sunday morning worship experience that we're planning, there's a lot of preparation going into that, I hope you'll invite a friend, come out and take part, I think you'll enjoy it, it'll be a great way to get into the Christmas week. Uh, mark that down. Also, starting next Sunday morning, the parking team is going to be active again. So when you come in, you'll see these gentlemen and ladies out there in their vests kind of directing, directing traffic. We know that things will start picking up, especially around the holidays. So just be looking for that. And I know that Christmas hasn't arrived yet, but I hope that as you're looking forward to the new year, if you are new to the church, you'll think about Connections Track. But also in the month of January... All of our small groups are going to be uh, kicking off, the rooted groups, the small groups. So if you haven't found a place to connect, keep your eyes open for all of those opportunities that will be coming your way. And there's just one other thing I want to talk to you about. We had our business meeting last Wednesday night, the annual business meeting for our church. Things went well. It was a good time together as a church family. But I wanted to bring you up to date. Pastor Bonnie shared with us that uh, we did the all-in campaign that we, uh, we ended last month. And as of this past week, our actual giving to All In is up to $115,000. And we have another $459,000 pledged. So we're at $574,000 for the All In campaign as of last month. <clears throat> And uh, that's on top of, folks, the $3.1 million we already had. And uh, we're still a good year or more in before we'll actually have to move into the new building. So you never know. We keep praying and trusting uh, that God's going to continue to provide. And we've said from the beginning, God, it's possible for God to move us into that new facility. And we have a mortgage burning on the day that we do our first worship service in that building. So just keep praying over that and uh, trusting God. But I will tell you that it's, it's been an interesting year and a half since we sold the facility. Uh, but the next part is the hard part. The next part that we're about to enter into um, I, and I have been so proud of how this congregation has reacted to all of the changes. I mean, most of you that have stuck it out and ridden it out with us and been a part, this has been a huge change. Every week, you never quite know what you're going to walk into at High Point, and I've been very proud of those of you that have um, ridden it out with us. But I remember one time a friend of mine laid this quote on me. He said, waiting is the hardest work of hope. Waiting is the hardest work of hope. Well, get ready for a lot of hard work now, because we're going to be doing a lot of waiting, and, um, and changes are going to continue, and uh, you know, no one likes change that impacts them. We all say that we want change until the change impacts us, and it's going to, infect, it's going to impact all of us, and challenges are going to continue space challenges and uh, every week we're kind of figuring out what we're doing with our children's space and that impacts families that worship uh, with us here and youth our our uh, our youth have done fantastic under pastor andy's leadership and the girls under uh, or the kids under uh, melissa's leadership and i just appreciate that and um and you know it's going to be like when you go on a trip with your kids and about 10 minutes in the first question is are we there yet and the question we're going to hear a lot this year is, how much longer? How much longer? And the answer is going to be just a little bit. Just a little bit longer than you want it to be. Just a little bit longer than you think it will be. But folks, if you hang in there, I promise you, we're going to get there and it's going to be worth it. And God has a wonderful future in front of this congregation. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for all of your generosity, for your patience, for the way you're working through uh, this with us. And just challenge you to hang in there with us in this next year. But again, primarily thank you. If you're in Luke chapter 1, we're going to read at verse 26. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, you can follow along on these references that are behind me. But uh, we pick up in the Advent narrative. The scripture says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. 
But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. <clears throat> well, how will this be, Mary asked, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So this Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. And the King James, that reads, For with God nothing will be impossible. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. So God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. And Luke tells us that Nazareth was a town in Galilee. We tells his readers that. Nazareth is a town in Galilee. And the reason he had to say that was because nobody that was reading his gospel would know where Nazareth was. In fact, most people wouldn't. If you weren't from there, you just wouldn't know. No one just went to Nazareth. Not even angels just went to Nazareth. That's why God had to send Gabriel there. And it wasn't the glamour assignment. Angel, or, hey, Gabriel, you, you get to go to Nazareth. Nobody was standing in line for that assignment in heaven. To be sent to Nazareth, probably Gabriel had to be given directions by God to find Nazareth. <laughs> Nazareth was a small town. The mayor of Nazareth was probably also the town barber. If you lived on 3rd Street in Nazareth, you were in the suburbs. You gave directions like, if you were giving directions in Nazareth, the directions were go to the stoplight and make a right at the Smith's barn and you'll find it. That's the way we got around in Nazareth. Shopping at Walmart or eating at McDonald's was a family outing. It required a 30-minute drive. That was a big day on the town in Nazareth. Nathaniel one time heard that the Messiah was in Nazareth, and in John he responded, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? He wasn't saying Nazareth was a place where nothing good happened as much as he was saying that Nazareth was a place where nothing happened, good or bad. And if anything did happen, whether it was good or bad, people remembered it and they talked about it forever. So, Mary is a teenage girl in this little town. Her engagement to Joseph, who's the local carpenter, has been written up in the weekly newspaper. It's the big social event of the year because they don't have many social events in Nazareth. And she's about to turn up pregnant before they get married. Scandalous. And it's hard to beat a small town scandal. So we're in this series, and I know it's, it's kind of an odd topic to pick for the season, scandalous. It's not a word that we think of when we think of Christmas. We associate words like Mary and peace and goodwill and happiness and joy, magical with the season of Christmas. Scandalous doesn't come to mind, but I think it's appropriate because the life and ministry of Jesus was full of scandal, and it ended on a cross, which Paul says is a stumbling block and an offense, and that word means it's a scandal for us to think that God came and died on a cross. It's a, an honest reading of the Advent narrative shows us that, that way from the beginning, scandal surrounded the life of Christ. Last week, we saw that Jesus, the Messiah of the Hebrews, had waited for for centuries and that humanity needed came to the world through a family line no one would have imagined, a scandalous family tree. And now you find out that he enters this, the world, this world of ours in a scandalous way. You know, folks, I think we think we know how God will work if there is a God, how he's supposed to work, and we think that we know what we need him to do for us. But God, I mean the real God, the God who reveals himself to us in Christ and in the scripture, never does things the way we think they should be done and rarely addresses the issues that we think are the most pressing issues in our life and in our world. Everything about Jesus challenges us, he challenges our intellect. He offends our sensibilities. He scandalizes our self-sufficiency and our self-righteousness. Last week, we saw that Advent forces us to rethink how God works in history and, and who God can work through. And now, <clears throat> we come to this story of Mary, 
And her interaction with God continues to challenge us and I think scandalize us in different ways than the first one that we looked at. Let me share with you a few levels I think this story challenges us on if you think honestly about it. And the first is the most obvious and the next is the most important and the last is the most personal. So let's start here. The most, the most obvious way that this story challenges us is it challenges our intellect. So again, starting at verse 31 of this passage, the angel appears and he says, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You're to call him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever of his kingdom. There will, now, he, there will never be any. And now if I'm Mary, everything after you will conceive is just blah, 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 right? So she gets down here and after he finally stops talking, she asks the question that's been on her mind ever since she heard you will conceive. How can this be since I am a virgin? Verse 35, the angel says, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so this Holy One who will be born will be known as the Son of God. Each of these challenges that I want to talk to you in is imposing for different reasons. And I'm not raising them in the order of their, uh, that they appear, but I think in the order of um, I, the difficulty they present. And this first challenge is a challenge to our intellect. Gabriel says, You're going you're gonna to have a baby. And Mary asked this question, how can this be since I am a virgin? Now, that's a pretty good question, don't you think? I mean, that's the first one that would have popped into my mind if I were Mary. This is a, this is a great question. I, and I feel compelled to bring this up just about every Christmas season because it confronts a problem we deal with here in the 21st century whenever Advent rolls around. We hear this account so often, especially if you were raised in church. You hear this, you see it in pageants and plays and productions, that before long, Christmas starts to take on a fairy tale feel for us. Even if we don't intend for that to happen, it starts to take on the same artificiality as the lights we hang on our tree and the nativities that are under our, our Christmas tree. And as I reminded you last week, the things that we remember at Advent were not written as fairy tale or legend. The gospel writers were communicating to us real things that happened to real people. So when Mary hears that she's going to be expecting, she asks exactly the same question any real person would ask. <clears throat> How can this be? I mean, look, I don't want to be rude. You're an angel and everything. I'm not trying to cause trouble here. I, I don't mean to be rude, but I know all about the birds and the bees, and there hasn't been any buzzing or chirping around here. So how can this be since I'm a virgin? Matthew tells us that, that when the news was broke to Joseph, when the angel breaks the news to Joseph, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. So what was Joseph's reaction to this news? He had it in his mind to divorce her. Well, of course he did. He had the same reaction that any red-blooded Polk County boy would have. Joseph knew how these things happened, and he knew he didn't make it happen. Edmund Burke one time said that we here in the modern age are guilty of what he calls a chronological snobbery. And this, what he means by that is we live with this assumption that these people that are written about back in Scripture were gullible hayseeds who believe stuff because they didn't have the knowledge that we do today. Well, folks, Mary and Joseph and everybody in that little town of Nazareth knew at least the basics of biology. They knew where babies come from. And the real challenge that we face in the Advent story isn't with biology or any science. It, that's not the real challenge that we face. It's with the presuppositions that we bring to the facts that are reported to us in this story. Now, let me stop here and see. I'm, I'm going to try real hard to explain this to you. So I'm going to give you one more scenario from modern day that might help you understand the struggle that we face with this story from the gospel. Suppose... And this is purely theoretical, by the way. This is purely theoretical. But suppose someone named Ben uses our fire stick remote at our house. And he lays it on the coffee table when he's done using it, and he walks away. The fire stick remote will stay right where he put it, right? Can I get an amen on that? They don't move. And yet... When Ben's mother wants to change the channel from football to watch Love It or List It, the remote is not where Ben says he left it. It had moved. And an investigation was conducted by his mother, and we learned that Ben was the last one in the house 
to have used the remote, Ben explained to us all very passionately that he had left the remote right here on the coffee table. That's where he left it. We explained to him that was quite impossible because the remote was not on the table. And remotes do not suddenly disappear. They don't come to life and walk away. They certainly just don't vanish into thin air. That defies common sense. And every law of physics that operates in the Hillegoss household. Did we think Ben was crazy? Did Ben think we were crazy? To tell us a story like that, like the remote just disappeared. We've been using remotes all of our adult lives. We know how they operate. We know what they can and cannot do. Remotes don't walk away. We explained this. We were at an impasse. But he insisted the remote had indeed been moved. We were exasperated by his naive approach to things. We deemed him a zealot who obviously believed in miracles and the impossible. So we all went to bed frustrated with one another. How had my son fallen into this cultish belief that remotes could move on their own? (laughs) And yet the next morning, we learned the remote had moved. It was discovered in a basket of freshly folded laundry. It had moved there. Or it had been moved there. And of course, normally, naturally, remotes don't just move. Parents, you might want to write this down. But something abnormal, something supernatural had happened so that remotes that normally couldn't move had in fact moved. Someone, some being, who oversees our entire household and can move any object to make it wherever she or he (laughs) wants it to go scooped it up and moved it into a laundry basket it's my birthday so I can get away with a lot of stuff today (laughs) and I'm having some fun with you but here's the point I'm trying to make folks we do live in a world that was designed to operate in certain normal predictable patterns and thankfully for us that's the way it operates most of the time it does the earth functions the way it always does life operates the way it always has babies get made the way they always have unless something or someone supernatural operates from the outside of the system unless they move on the system Something or someone from outside the system with the power to do so makes something that isn't normal, something that isn't natural, something that is impossible happen. That's what we call a miracle. And our problem with them isn't our understanding of science. Our problem is, what do you believe about God? If there's a God, there's no problem with believing in miracles. If there's a God, then God can do whatever God wants to do whenever God wants to do it. God designed the whole show. God operates the whole system. If God wants to, he can interrupt things and change things. He can make things happen differently than they naturally happen. Of course, blind men naturally don't see. Of course, you naturally can't feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. Of course, men don't naturally walk on water. And of course, virgins don't naturally get pregnant unless the God who created it all and runs it all puts his hand on it and makes something supernatural occur. So when Mary asks, how can this be? God says, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. The minute you exert God into the equation, nothing is impossible. The reason we don't believe it isn't because of science. People who know just as much about science and more than any of us in this room do don't have a problem. The problem is with your presupposition that God doesn't exist because once you concede there is or at least could be a God, then the idea of a virgin birth isn't impossible. It's still improbable, right? I mean, I mean it only happened once. Billions and billions of babies born, still only one of them has been born by a virgin, but it did happen that one time. And it, it happened according to Scripture. But Ben couldn't even convince us that he was innocent when it came to a remote. Imagine what Mary was going to trying to explain to her boyfriend that she was innocent in this matter, too. Joseph didn't believe her at first. Who would? No rational human being would buy into this story. And when you understand that, then you understand why the Christmas story, and really, all of the Christian faith, if you're thinking seriously about it, challenges you intellectually. 
And if you've never wrestled with it on that level, you haven't thought about it deeply enough. The Christian faith presents us re with realities that are beyond our understanding and they're beyond our comprehension. But folks, a God who is small enough for you to comprehend is too small for you to worship. A God that is small enough for you to comprehend is too small for you to worship. And still that takes us to the deeper challenge, and I think it's the, the harder challenge. It's closer to the real thing we struggle with. Christmas, this story challenges our comfort. So this is the greater challenge for Mary, and the reason we all truly struggle with the Christian faith and the Christmas story with all of the gospel. Mary was pledged to be married. She was engaged. God sent Gabriel to this young lady in a comfortable little town who was making exciting plans for her nice, safe, predictable, small-town life. She was already registered at Target. She was already picking out furniture. She was already making plans for how the first year of marriage was going to go. She was preparing for life as a small-town housewife. It is all very normal, and I think Mary was good with that. I think she was happy with this arrangement. Now, we live in a fairly small town, and we joke about it a little bit or a lot, and we complain about it some. There's never anything to do around here. But most of us who live in small towns live in small towns because we like living in small towns. Why would you be here otherwise? I'm just going to let you all in on it because most of you are natives. Whenever ever somebody says to me, we just moved to Lake Wales, my first question is why? <laughs> why? I know the answer, but I'm wondering how you found out, you know? And we, we live in small towns because we like it. We like the predictability. We're good with the routine. If we want adventure, we drive up to Orlando, spend a little time with the crazies up there, and then come back home to where the normal people live. Can I get an amen, you know? We go up there, we get a little craziness, we get a little congestion, and then we thank God we don't live in that hellhole and come back to Lake Wales. We're small town people. Mary was a small town girl. Then God shows up. <laughs> and I love how Gabriel speaks to her. Greetings, you who are highly favored. And then he repeats it. Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. So God's about to do Mary a favor. Okay, Gabriel, lay it on me. What's the favor you're going to do for Mary? Well, you're going to be pregnant. How's that for a favor? That's right, Mary. You could enjoy nine months of morning sickness and body mutations and strange cravings. You get to explain to your fiancé how it happened. You get to become the subject of small-town gossip for the rest of your life. In your last trimester, you get to travel across country on a donkey and give birth in a barn. Oh, and this little baby you're going to go through so much to deliver, Herod's going to be jealous of him, so you're going to have to flee the country to keep him alive. And after you raise him, you get to watch him die a brutal, unjust, untimely death in your old age. That's the favor. You're welcome. I wonder if Mary wasn't tempted to say, Lord, if it's all the same, don't do me any favors. <laughs> this is a much bigger struggle than the intellectual struggle, and this is where most of us have our problem with God. In fact, most of us, we just use the intellectual arguments to, to camouflage the real problems we have with the Christian faith. I'm going to say that again so it lands and parks in your heart somewhere. Most of people use intellectual arguments to camouflage the real problem that you have with God and the Christian faith. We say we don't believe in a God that gets involved in normal life because we don't want God messing with our normal life. You guys see this movie that's coming out about Mr. Rogers? Tom Hanks is in it. It's, it's obviously hot in this crowd. It's okay, so I'm just going to let you in on it. So, Tom Hanks is starring as Mr. Rogers. It just released around Thanksgiving. It's called A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. How many of you grew up wa watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? Okay, from what I understand, it's going to be a really good movie. I thought it was the most boring children's show that was ever made, but hey, it's just me. But I, this movie is about Fred Rogers, and, and if you remember this, it was always the same thing. And Fred would walk, Mr. Rogers would walk in the door. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and he would sit down, and he would take off his outside shoes and put on his inside shoes, and he'd put on a cardigan sweater, and he would walk us into this wonderful little fantasy world where everything always functioned exactly the same way, and everything was nice. So I read a review um, in, in some magazine this past week about the movie. I was waiting to get my eyes checked, and so I, I read a review. And here's what the review said. 
It's a movie about how much we need Mr. Rogers right now. It's a movie about how much we need a movie in which Tom Hanks plays Mr. Rogers. We're so starved for niceness right now. We need reasons to be happy, and we will milk any source of it dry. Now, I'm not sure if the author is right about what people want or need from this movie, but I do think he captures what many of us want or think we need from God. Why do you come to church? Why do you say you believe in God? What are you looking for from God? I think that most of us, when we picture God and think of the goodness of God, want Him to be like Mr. Rogers. We want a Mr. Rogers God. We want a God to be safe, predictable, soft-spoken, affirmative. We want a nice God. We want a nice God who lives in our neighborhood and shows up at the same time on schedule every Sunday. If we bother to show up, He'll be there. And He always comes in the same door. He always changes his shoes so our floors don't get, get messy, wears the same red cardigan so we can see him coming, tells us nice stories, keeps us safe and entertained, and knows when to go home so we can start drinking adult beverages. But that nice, safe God doesn't exist. The real God, the God of Christmas, the God who showed up in the flesh and came to dwell among us is a wild, dangerous, risky unpredictable God and he's not interested in how comfortable you are he shows up in our small town in the middle of our small stories grabs us by the hand forces us to jump into the middle of tough taxing significant life change and adventure we talk so much this time of year about the spirit of Christmas and often when we use those words we're sighing wistfully about how we can't catch the Christmas spirit I just can't get into the spirit I can't seem to get into the Christmas spirit and when we speak of Christmas spirit we usually mean this feeling of nostalgia and sentimental warmth that we want to feel look at what Mary felt on the first Christmas Mary was greatly troubled and the angel said don't be afraid she was scared to death and by the way that's pretty common do you remember what happened when the angels show up to sing about the Messiah to the shepherds the scripture says they were terrified by what was happening do those words make you think about Christmas troubled fearful terrified but those words those are the emotions that were the most prevalent in the original Christmas story because when the living God shows up in your life, he, 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 you know that he is about to ask you to do something or give something or be involved in something that's going to be beyond you. God's going to ask you to change something that you had planned. Go somewhere that you're afraid to go. Try to do something you don't think you can do. God's going to challenge you and stretch you and grab you by the hand and drag you into ministry and commitment that will call for your best and often break your heart. He'll call you to give stuff you don't want to give, do things you don't think you can do, challenge you to end relationships you don't think you can live without. And you know, he really is doing us a big favor when he does that, but it sure doesn't feel like a favor on the front end when grace goes to work in your life. I looked this up this week, and do you know that the word favor is the same root as the word grace? They're the same thing. God doing for us something we can't do for ourselves, and often grace means God doing for us things we would never think to do for ourselves, and maybe don't even want God to do for us. And again, we think of God's grace, we think of Him saving us from sin and from the dangers that are attached to sin, but I can tell you that God's grace also came, comes to save us from our selfishness and the danger that's attached to our selfishness, the danger of a small, safe life, the danger of saving up for the whole world and losing your soul. We all grew up reciting Psalms chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It sounds so peaceful. In verse 6 it says this, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Do you know that that literally means surely your goodness and mercy will pursue me? Surely your goodness and mercy will chase me down. Surely your goodness and mercy will run after me. God's grace chases us and runs after us because we spend so much time running away from Him and trying to stop our ears up and not hear what he's asking us to do. God's grace chases us and runs after us because we spend so much time. We want the comfort. 
We want the credit rating. We want the expense account. We want the reliable benefits. We want the small town, the small part in the small town, but God thinks too highly of you to let you play your life small. His grace challenges you to bigger things. So think about this. When was the last time you were involved in anything that made you the least bit uncomfortable? When was the last time that anything unpredictable about your faith ever took place? When was the last conversation you felt like God asked you to have that made you nervous? When was the last commitment to any service or ministry that interrupted your comfortable schedule? When was the last time you gave in, gave in a way that caused you to forego any, th any kind of pleasure or put off any kind of purchase? When was the last time you ever even considered going into a ministry or a job that, or giving up a job that you've been in for years and pursuing another job? And you keep putting it off because you don't know how to have the conversation with your wife or your husband. And so days and weeks and months just keep slipping by because you're scared to death to just talk to somebody about it. Some of you are going to bed every night with the same delayed dream because you just don't have the guts to have a conversation. When are you going to be willing to enter into that, to that reality? You may be closer to the Christmas spirit when you're scared than you've ever been in your life. Which brings me to the last way I think that this story challenges us. It challenges our expectation. I didn't know whether to say expectation or awareness. Do you live with an expectation? Do you live with an awareness? We've seen that fear is the word that appears in most of these Advent narratives, and I was just talking about this with someone before church today, but every one of us has got a phobia. And it's probably not smart in a church community full of people like attend High Point Church to let them know what you're afraid of, because that tends to come back around on you. But I'm going to tell you one of my fears. Um, and you all pray for me in the coming week, okay? I'm afraid of snakes. I can't stand them. Thank you, thank you. And here's the problem. Here's what I've figured out, though. I'm not really scared of snakes. Uh, what scares me about snakes is how they show up, right? They always show up in places they're not supposed to be at times when they're not supposed to be there. You never expect to see a snake, do you? I mean, when you open your door and walk out your door, there's not supposed to be a snake there. I mean, black snakes, you, you, black snakes sunning themselves. Uh, here's what happened to me the last time I had an encounter. This is when our church offices were right back here. I'm walking out the church office as a black snake sunning itself outside the church office. Now, if the snake would have just called the office and said, Pastor Jack, just wanted to let you know I'm going to be slithering up to the sidewalk this morning. I'll be right outside the door taking a little sun bath. I would have probably said, hello, Mr. Snake. Enjoy yourself. Instead, I stepped out the door. There he is, and I went, ah, or something like that. And came as close to dancing as this white boy ever will. And I... The fear, the fear, the reaction that I had to the snake is because I do not live expecting a snake ever to show up in my life. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm wondering if that's what's behind many of our fears as well. We all say that we believe in a living God who can invade our world, but none of you ever expect it to happen today. You didn't even come to church today thinking anything was going to change. Most of you were making your lunch plans before we sang the first song this morning. And some of you are on Facebook right now telling people to meet you because Pastor Jack's within five minutes of being finished. <laughs> and you know what I found out about God is He doesn't make appointments. He doesn't make appointments. He just shows up. The call to the adventure is never going to be convenient for you. And you can't tell God to wait. But what if we responded like this? Last verse, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. And the angel left her. What if a bunch of folks, or just one, who attended High Point Church and was wrestling with what God wanted in your life would finally just say, I'm your servant. Let your word be fulfilled in my life. So here's what I've been praying this week. We preachers know what the sermons are supposed to be about during the Advent season. And you know what? What We're always trying to find creative ways to package this Christmas story so that you'll listen to us for a few more Sundays. 
When I came up with this title, Scandalous, I have to tell you, I really have been hoping and praying that something scandalous would happen in our church. Not the kind of stuff that people in small churches and small towns usually consider scandalous, but the kind of stuff that rarely happens. People bowing their heads and saying, I'm your servant. Do whatever you want to do with my life. The kind of stuff that gets a small town talking. Did you hear about the guy who made the daring decision to change the career and go into ministry? Did you hear about that person that finally answered God's call? Did you hear about the sacrifices? Did you hear about that church that sold their building and relocated? Maybe just make a decision to, to, to stop going through the church motions and actually decide to be holy. If, if, if just a few people would bow their heads to the God who unexpectedly showed up and challenged you and said, I'm your servant today. Let your word be fulfilled in my life. I think that would be scandalous in the best way possible. Wouldn't it be great if Lake Wales was talking about stuff like that? So I want you to bow your heads with me this morning. And I'm, I'm just going to ask you to think about this. Worship team's coming. They're going to lead us in a time, and then we're going to dismiss, but we've got a few minutes left together to worship. And Every Sunday morning, I think one of the reasons that we come here is because we have an opportunity to quiet ourselves and really pay attention to what the Spirit of God may be speaking here in this atmosphere to your heart. Some of you are here today, and you've been wrestling with a decision to ask Christ to forgive your sins and make you his child and even if you don't know what all that means or what all the challenges are that are going to be attached to that you've been wrestling with that you're just a few feet away from an altar and you've been wrestling with it and i pray that today would be the day you finally just say i'm your servant let your word be fulfilled in my life some of you have been holding on to something that god's been asking you to give away you keep clutching it and I'm praying that today would be the day you say, I'm your servant, Lord, whatever you want. Let your word be fulfilled in my life. Some of you have a call. Some of you have a, a career path that needs to change. And you know it, you know it, but you haven't had the conversation with the person you're married to. You're scared to death. Today would be the day. That's my prayer. And so when we worship together in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you just to do some real honest business with the Lord, and I hope that some of you will finally be able to say, I'm your servant. Father, today, during this Advent season, what we really are reminded of is while we're grateful for the historic events that we celebrate that made all of the difference in our lives and makes this day meaningful, this day is what's important for us right now. And we're praying, God, that today, this morning, you would help some of us to have the same courage to say the same thing that Mary said. No matter how much it scares us, no matter how much it challenges us, no matter how much it moves us out of our comfort level, that today we might be willing to say, I am your servant, Lord. Let your word be fulfilled in my life. So I'm asking you to give that kind of courage to whoever needs it this morning, and that when we walk out of this place, our next step will be the step of obedience. For your glory, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, folks. Let's worship together. If you need prayer, you come.